Good afternoon, everyone. Hi. Um, welcome to what is going to be the next hour, our free sessions and a Q&A. So my name is Dan Taylor, and I'm going to be kicking us off with basically how voice search and also parts of artificial intelligence can present some opportunities in the future for iGaming. Um, just one little warning and heads up, whenever I talk with a handheld mic, I tend to turn my head, but then actually not take the mic with me. So if I do that, someone just flag me so I can stop doing that for everyone to hear still. So a little bit about me. Um, I'm a senior consultant and account director at an agency called Salt, with, uh, based in London. Also got an office up north in Leeds and also in Boston, in Massachusetts. Um, our research into some technical SEO won an award over there last year and I'm also on a couple of lists of top SEOs and other nice ego stroking things like that as well. And we also develop some software pieces as well, such as HF Lang Checker and something called Sloth, which I'm actually going to cover on in a little bit as well. So with voice search, it's not so much that we're actually just talking about using our voices to actually command and control things. The best way of putting this is we're actually now starting to live in what we're calling the age of assistance because it's not just our smartphones that have voice capability. We've also now moved on to things like smartwatches, the smart speakers, and even smart appliances where even I went fridge shopping last week and I can buy a fridge that communicates with my phone when we're low on milk. That's a level of privacy I did not need invading by a device. But essentially, we're interacting with devices in a lot of different ways, and that can present a lot of opportunities for how, in the gaming and affiliate sector, we can actually produce content and get it in front of users and potentially introduce new people to brands to get FTDs or actually broaden brand scope and provide customer service as a whole. Voice search isn't actually something that's new. There was a form of it back in 2010 um, through Google, but this, when I say it was cumbersome, you actually had to get a code off your screen, telephone a number, give them the code, save a query, then give another code back for the results to come up on your screen. It probably took about 10 minutes to do, all truth be told, so it's probably just quicker to actually do the typing. But since then, that actually led to other developments in technologies at places like Google and then further updates such as the Hummingbird update in 2013, which enabled Google to then better understand what it calls semantic search. So that wasn't so much people typing in a query, it was better trying to understand the intent behind the query and what people are actually meaning and wanting to see. This has led on to other facets of search, such as local and a few other pieces, but essentially with voice, that was the foundations of actually being able to respond to a query because if you ask it a question, it needs to be able to understand the entities involved. Google is very conservative still with the data it gives us about voice search and how it works, but every now and again, it does actually trickle a little bit through. So this graph is actually now from the end of 2017, but it was an idea of how people are interacting with a Google Voice Assistant, which back then was on a select number of Android phones and also powering Google Home devices. Essentially, everything around search in respect of the moment, especially your smartphones, is quite heavily action orientated still. It's still very much play Spotify, create a shopping list, call the living room, other things. But interestingly, people are starting to use it for interactions with news, such as checking sports scores, which actually was the highest news checking item that Google found in the data. The data then further went on in the article to actually further explain how action orientated it actually is. And despite the fact when people talk about voice search, they say people use long queries, they say what is, where is, they use question based things, everything has a definitive action at the time, and people are still wary about using it as a conversational measure. But, as I'll show, other data does actually show that people do expect conversations in the past six months more than they have from voice search previously. It's also important to understand that voice search isn't just limited to Google and to actual search engines itself. Everyone and everything technological is actually now starting to move into it. So obviously you've got Google, Siri, um, Cortana, Bixby. Amazon now has AI-powered microwaves, which are powered by Alexa, so you can voice control your microwave. 
and also towards the end of last year, Ford put $1 billion into actually creating artificial intelligence and smart voice controls within um, cars moving forwards. That's actually a podcast episode on Free Economics, which I recommend listening to their CEO because he actually explains what their vision for is for the future. And typically when someone puts that much money into something, it generally shapes part of the market from there on because once the research is done, it can be replicated. We also then get the insights what we know from Google themselves. And it's basically that everything that's been said all along, there was a statement in 2015 that by 2020, over um, the number of voice search queries will doubled and voice will take over text search. Google don't expect that to happen, nor do they think it will. But what they are looking to do is create more conversational, what they call conversational AI, and actually bring the assistant side of it, because essentially, whilst Google's there to provide answers and whilst devices are there to actually do something, people are expecting actions and outcomes from using voice as a query. Similarly at SMX last week actually in America, um, Marco Linoki, who was actually one of Google engineers, um, said they're working on trying to build relevancy rather than scope in what the search is, and they expect visuals to still play a big part. And we know this is one of Google's actual main points, is not just words, because the latest Google homes all have screens, and Alexa and Amazon are now moving as well away from a speaker model towards a screen model. So whilst voice search will play a part, it's not going to overtake screens, it's not going to overtake traditional search as a whole. But what it does do is it gives us the opportunity to actually create conversations with people as a brand that we haven't previously been able to do in ways that we haven't been able to do through new technologies. So going back to what Google have said, and again this is Scott Hoffman who was a first quote, on average queries to Google Assistant are what they call 200 times more conversational than a standard query. So conversational can basically, by their definition, mean it's a question. It's an interrogative statement. They're looking to find information or rather than just like saying, turn light on, they're actually using, please, can you turn the light on and speaking in full sentences. That's not necessarily useful data, but it is an expectation of how, as a human, we're psychologically interacting with what is effectively a box of blinking LEDs. Bing then released some data as well, about three years ago, which showed that all the data going through Alexa, which is Bing powered, not Google powered, is actually showing that Alexa queries are roughly between seven and eight words long, whereas normal search queries one to three. So it's again showing the conversational aspect. And going back to the conversational side, they say we're at 70% more natural language. So it's using stop words. It's speaking to it as if it's something in the room that is actually going to speak back at some point. And that's the point is the half expectation. Now, in terms of how we can interject into the actual user journey and find a placement for this, again, we still have very little data from Google. But last year, they did actually start to give us some buyer insight data from people who own Google Home devices. So they actually started to tell us where they actually have them in the home. Um, and mostly, surprisingly, it's in communal areas and family areas where you'd expect multiple people to use them. Small percentages and under a port are keeping them in the kitchen, but again, it tells us the sort of areas and the sort of points in someone's life cycle that you might be able to catch them. If someone's in a communal area, such as a living room or a dining room, it's probably safe to say they're not probably going to be using that device nine to five, Monday to Friday, probably late evenings, weekends, it's about finding natural touch points within the actual user's life to interject. On that note, the other surprising figures they actually gave is over half people actually in the site surveys would actually be open to receiving promotional messages about sales and other brands they subscribe to. So similar to email marketing, people would actively opt in to receiving notifications such as this. Similarly, they'll that they'll actually seek out personalized information. So if you develop Alexa skills or Google Home skills to produce information around sporting events, people will be welcome for that intrusion into their lives if it's something they're relevant into. And similarly, again, 42% may want to actually know about the upcoming events. So people are open to these devices, not just being static call upon, but actually 
similar to basically a push notification or a similar marketing message that they will receive some kind of marketing from them. The flip side of that is, however, is that 48% obviously don't. So it is a clear split 50-50, near enough, in terms of how people are receptive. But this same poll about three, four years ago, the numbers looked a lot different and people were still afraid of voice search assistants. So knowing what rooms people use voice search devices in and how people work with it, that's when we can start looking at the usage habits and actually start finding the touch points. And that's really where the opportunities arise to actually brand and market to people through voice search and make sure the content's there. Now, the things that we do know from data is that obviously it's 40% more action orientated, it's 200 times more conversational, Screens are still going to play a big part in everything, including through smartphones. Daily routines matter, and voice is universal. That being said, how people actually search hasn't really changed that much in the last five years. People still use questions, they still type questions. That's not going to change. And optimizing for voice search in that way, yeah, if you run a poker site and you've not got content on actually how to play poker, I'm questioning the overall strategy full start when it comes to search because you want to be capturing people at different points of the funnel, especially first-time players and first-time users. Similarly, everything we know about how to optimize for voice search, we know it comes down to having the content in a specific way, and we also know there's an element of artificial intelligence, neither of which can be directly optimized for in a one-to-one -one fashion, but we can start to educate and do better things and create better data sets for search engines to retrieve, which then result in voice queries. For example, we know there's a correlation between um, actual voice search queries and featured snippets through search, with a lot of featured snippets actually appearing as voice search queries through Google Assistant. Similarly, video is also being used as well and being pulled through to actual voice queries. Even though the voice query isn't the spoken one back, the screen plays a big part and it's given a visual response to an, to an actual verbal question. It is worth noting whilst putting these together, for every one I did try to get a screenshot of matching, I did find ones that didn't match. So I said, everything correlates. We don't need to have a direct silver bullet. This will definitely work. Similarly, a lot of content actually created like this actually still works. And this is the sort of content we should be producing to actually try and capture the voice queries, especially around certain types. So it's forgetting brand, it's forgetting the market, it's focusing on the question oriented things that potential new signups, new players, people researching might do. So you can get that brand exposure at a very early stage and then build on from there and lead down the funnel. We also know other correlations going on that all the, uh, most websites returning voice queries are secure. We know with long form content, there's an average of 22 headers. Similarly, we know that they've got to be mobile friendly and mobile usability has got to be high. So again, pretty much there's a lot of correlations between what actually ranks in normal Google search versus what works in voice search. We also have the option of using Speakable, which is a new schema markup, which is currently in beta. Again, this can be used and wrapped around query-based questions and good content. That being said, at the moment, it is only available in America. But as a long-term strategy, it is something to look at to mark up to Google clearly. This is a potential question someone might ask. Here's an appropriate answer for it. And that's how you can start competing in that space. It doesn't necessarily have to be an audio response. It can be video, it can be picture. It can be anything because screens are still going to play a part and the evolution as what we're seeing with smart devices is moving towards screens. If you want to see a good example of a scheme in the wild, I've called it, Search Engine Roundtable have implemented it, which is a good news site. And then if you've also got a legacy platform and you want to implement it, there's a tool out there called Sloth, um, sloth.cloud, and that can easily integrate the scheme room for you. So essentially, just to summarize on that side, everything on that side of technical content has to be pretty much the same as what you do for normal SEO, but it's just making sure of the good practices of it you've got the good structures and thinking how people actually speak to devices and how they interact with them. 
for example, if people are looking for um, information about injuries for Premier League players for an accumulator on the weekend, you expect that to probably happen Saturday mornings or Sunday mornings, likely not a Wednesday afternoon. So it's about understanding where the touch points are and having the content ready to interact with the person at the right time when they want to work that way. That's all being said, we know voice search is changing a lot and there's still a lot we don't know. So this, for anyone who isn't familiar, this is actually a screenshot um, taken by someone called Gianluca Ferrelli last week of server logs. So that's the direct response from your web server to a robot or a user agent or people like me when we go looking. And we can see that Google is actually crawling this website with a brand new bot called Google Speaker. There is no documentation on Google's site or anything about what Google Speaker is. And it's only in the past 24 hours we've actually managed to get a response from them saying, yeah, it's a, it's a form of um, actual smart devices having their own user agent to, to discover voice controlled content. So that puts more importance on the website actually being able to be crawled by Google and fully understood by it and other search engines to produce focal results in that way. So I appreciate I'm just running out of time because I should have only five minutes, but essentially, when it comes down to the speaking, Google has certain guidelines for what it needs to be. Everything needs to be satisfactory in terms of the answer itself. The length of answer needs to fit well into a spoken snippet. The formulation of how it's written needs to actually be good. No grammar errors, no weird fonts, no weird characters. And basically, when it's elocuted, it needs to sound as if a human's actually speaking it and it's not just been put together by a robot. Google have produced guidelines on this, which if you hunt hard enough on the internet or follow the link on that slide, you can actually find. Um, and it's a publicly available PDF, which their raters are actually asked to use and how they um, evaluate the quality of certain voice search results. Um, so that's everything from me. Uh, thank you for listening. We are going to do a Q&A at the end of all three sessions. So I um, just want to hand over to Alexander. All right. Who's loud? Uh, my name is Alexander. Uh, work as an SEO manager at Better Collective, an affiliate company based in uh, Copenhagen, Denmark. And I'm going to talk to you about uh, RankBrain, how Google is using machine learning, and how we commit some mistakes sometimes, and how Google might punish us for it. So. Um, First of all, of course, the mandatory John Miller slide. Every SEO talk has to have one. As often, it's not very useful. Basically, search is very complex. OK. Um, but so basically, nobody knows how Rank Brain works. What we do know is that Google sits on a ton of information. And using machine learning, it can dig into it, and it can make some patterns and um, get into our websites and try to understand how it works. So I'm going to try to show you three, what I believe, mistakes uh, that is related to mass content and patterns in data. Right? So first mistake is we give Google a lot of content. A lot of it is crap. And it's a problem for us. It's a growing problem, especially in the sports betting industry. Right? So here's, um, here's a I would say, a regular sports betting website. Right? A lot of leagues, a lot of countries, a lot of markets. Uh, oftentimes, we only pay attention to the index pages. Here, about half a million pages. How often do we think about the pages that are not indexed, that are excluded? Right? With the new Google Search Console, we can actually dig into the data, and we can see what's going on on the website. Right? The iceberg, so to speak. So what about these 9 million pages? So I will just show you one type of status code from Google Search Console and try to explain right, what it could mean. So Soft404s, how many are aware of Soft404s and know what that is? Please raise your hands. Only, nobody knows about Soft404s? Wow, OK. So good. Um, it's, a, it's a code that's growing in a lot of websites. Basically, Soft404 is you give Google a page that you want Google to index. Google doesn't want to index it. It thinks it's a bad page. Right? So in layman's terms, when Google comes and visits the page, we send the status code, OK, you can index it. However, Google deems that the content is not full enough. It's not, 
uh, clear enough, there's too little content, it's too thin, whatever that means, right? So Google simply refuses. And that's the case a lot of the times nowadays, that we can do great technical SEO, but if the content is bad, Google will not respect it, right? So, a few examples that might worry us. First of all, here's, um, here's a regular tip page. This is a, um, a page that usually lists uh, betting tips for tennis, for a specific league. We don't have any betting tips, right? Normal page. So what happens with the page? Google says, no, I'm not going to index it. It's a soft 404. Note that we have the page, the survey is working fine, but Google doesn't want to index it. And it gets worse, right? So here, here we have um, a team page with team-specific odds, usually. Again, at this point in time, which is very common on a big sports betting website, we don't have any odds. But we have some customer offers, some free bets, which I know that you guys here in the UK, you love free bets, right? Should be OK. No. Google says no. I won't index it. And here, here it gets even worse, right? This one is really annoying for me. So this is the um, Spielix Bannon, is a Danish market leader in uh, sports betting tips. We have a manually written match prediction, almost 300 words, right? If you cover hundreds and hundreds of matches every week, it takes a lot of time for journalists to write content. So I would say, in my book, this is a good page. We have contextual content. We have contextual offers. And Google says no. 300-word match prediction. Still, it's too thin. So how should we as SEOs approach this problem? Right. So my solution is Google the keyword, go through the top results, try to figure out what is the lowest threshold to be ranked at all. Right? And when you stack it like this next to each other and only look at the word count, yeah, we can see that the software 4 page in this case, the betting tip uh, page for tennis tips is too thin. Therefore, it will not rank. Right? And this can change at any point. So basically, we have to do our homework. Right? We can have a lot of uh, pages trying to target leagues, tournaments, whatever. If we don't have the data, we cannot rank anymore. Right? That's a common mistake on a big sports betting website. Mistake number two. Yeah, we talk about this all the time at SEO conferences, that keywords are dead. For sure they are not, but we're too obsessed about them. Right? So I have some good examples. This is from the German market, Beste Wettanbieter, which basically means best bookmakers. And you can see here, we have one website called Wettbasis, right? It's a huge website in, in Germany, in Austria. We have two pages ranking. One page has the featured snippet and is ranking at number two. And then we have a third page, the one that we would like to rank, and is down there at number three. And you can see also, just I just uh, highlighted the keyword there. You can see we included the keyword in the page title. It's still number three. The question is, why did Google pick the other page? Right? It doesn't even mention the keyword in the title. Yes, it's a number two, and it has a snippet. So let's take a deeper look at these two pages. Right? So the, what I call the contender page, the one that I would like to rank, classic on-page SEO. Everybody does this on the sports betting websites. We mentioned it in the menu, a lot of internal links, right? Good. We have a side menu, right? In Germany, we have different designs. We have side menu. We mentioned it in the headline. In fact, I mean, we mentioned the keyword nine times, right? Better than 90 for sure, right? But we mentioned the keyword, classic SEO. What about the page that is actually ranking number two and has the snippet? Well, basically, no. And I would even be tougher and say that the keyword we have here in the text, it's not even exact match. It's a phrase match. So if you want to be tough about it, we don't, we don't mention the keyword on the page. Yet this is the page that Google picked out. What's going on? So if you just stack the pages side by side, you start to see something that's interesting, right? First of all, the page that is the winner page has much longer content. I want to read about the best bookmakers in Germany. I want to go very deep into the topic or Google assumes that you have to cover all the subtopics or you're not going to rank. That's the first. The second is, have a look at the bookie tables. Right? The contending table doesn't really give any information. Standard rating, but it's not really useful for anyone. The winning table, however, 
breaks up all the different categories for the bookmakers, right? You have live betting, you have support, mobile betting, and so forth. So now I kind of understand why they rated Bet365 so highly. And Google understands that also, most likely. So you can see that this is what I mean by going beyond keywords. For sure, as always, it's probably good to include the keyword in the title. I would probably do that. But as you can see, that's not what matters always these days. You have to deliver. The content has to deliver or you will not rank. And I know some people probably right now are thinking, yeah, but what about the links? Maybe it's about the links. Check your data. It's not always about the links, right? It's very hard for us to backtrack nowadays. I just included a slide just to, um, to, to do so convincing. So you can see here we have trust flow on page level. You can see that the winning page has actually lower trust flow than the contender page. Um, and you can see that the number one result has even lower trust flow. Tons of other link metrics, for sure. We could go stand here all day talk about links. But what you will find many times is you need to deliver on the content. If you only, only obsess about the keywords, you're not going to rank anymore. And that for sure is down to rank brain. And it's getting better every week, right? Last mistake. Everybody's talking about search intent. The problem that I always have at these SEO conferences, I never see one good search intent analysis. What does it mean? How do we find out what the search intent is, right? So a few examples. I bet a lot of you would like to rank for this one, Bet365 Review. If you go through the results, note that 9 out of 10 results are user commentary driven. In fact, the top, I would say like top 4, top 5 sites, almost entirely consisting of user commentary. There's no editorial review whatsoever. That's the search intent. Google or the users are saying, we don't want to read another affiliate editorial review. We want to see what actual users think. And also, as you can see, the rating will be very different, but that's a different story. But you can see the search intent is very different. You're not going to rank here with our ordinary editorial review. So I have one, an, another example here. We can go a bit deeper. How do we approach this? So um, this might not be so familiar to you unless you're living in Denmark, but uh, every year uh, in the New Year's Eve, we have the queen. She holds a speech. Very important, right? You sit where you have your champagne, you have your, uh, you have your bread. Um, and of course, it's a huge betting event in Denmark because every time the queen has to mention certain words, yes, Greenland is part of Denmark, almost. Um, so the Danes are betting on which words and phrases will be mentioned in the queen's speech. It's hilarious, it's hilarious, but it's a big betting event. The question is, how do you rank for this term, right? So the odds, odds for Q, uh, Queen's new received speech, how do you rank for it? So if you go through all the results and stack the content next to each other, some pattern emerges here. So I took the time, I went through all the results, and what you find is the guys at the top, they have a lot of odds, a lot of odds in table format. Then they mention some strategy, what has the Queen talked about previous years, for instance, what is she likely to talk about this year due to politics and so forth? But the main point is to see odds. If you don't deliver 50 plus, 100 plus odds, you, clearly you're not ranking because the people who think that they should deliver news articles are at the bottom. Thus, the primary search intent is to see tons of odds. Secondary intent, yeah. Betting theory, betting strategy in, in relation to these odds. Main thing, to deliver as many odds as possible, right? But then the question is, when should I do this analysis? When should I do this research? Because Google is now so smart also, it has figured out that people want different things at different times. Right. So one example. Um, this little World Cup game we had last year, Iceland versus Croatia, odds preview. Right? Regular search would be great to rank for it. Notice which sites are ranking at which day. Right? We had the game time at the 26th of June. And you can see every single day, Google shuffled around in the mobile search results. Every single day, there were totally new results. On the game day, what happened, I should go back, we had a news carousel, but we also had a video carousel. So Google added another SERP feature on the day of the game. With machine learning, they can see the search volume. They can relate it to what people want. Totally different results. So what, what can we extract from this? Well, if you go deeper on the match day, first of all, you probably need a YouTube strategy. 
right? Unless I did my research on the day of the game, I wouldn't know that. I need a YouTube strategy. The other affiliates, they have YouTube videos and they're ranking there, probably stealing the clicks. I could be number one, but if people prefer to look at the videos, I will not get those clicks, right? Secondly, note the, um, the news sites that are ranking at the top. All of them were also ranking in the news carousel. And lo and behold, they were AMP pages. And AMP, as we all know, not very easy to implement at times. There were WordPress plugins that worked so-so, I would say. But again, th this is the landscape. This is the playing field. This is what we had to deliver on. So if the top ranking sites, they were AMP pages, they were in the news carousel, and they were YouTube videos, at least I had to take that into regard when I do my search intent analysis. Because if I would do my analysis two days before, or one day after, it's useless. You know, because the traffic isn't worth anything anymore. So search intent analysis is very important, but also when do you do the analysis? When is the search volume peaking for this keyword? Also very important. And I will leave you with that. So after this, uh, you will hear the last speaker here talk about uh, app store optimization. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, hi guys. Um, I'm going to take you away from the world of the SEO and the world of the SEO. We're going to be talking a lot both about Google and um, Apple as well. So um, I work for a company called AppAni. We do mobile data analytics across the world. So we help users from a standpoint of the discovery all the way to the monetization. Uh, any kind of the mobile data you are looking for, we can help you with. So we originally started within the gaming industry, so that was our number one client. Then we moved into the finance, we moved into the retail space, and recently we have moved into the gambling as well. So in the bottom you can see some of the people that we work with. So we have uh, almost one million plus clients across the world, a thousand enterprise clients, so, and all of them use app and connected services as well. So before we actually jump into the SO, I want to also talk to you about the app world and what's happening in the app industry. Um, and I think uh, one of the first charts to start off with is this one. So we do this analysis every year where we look at the previous year and try to understand what happened. And the number to look out for is actually 194 billion. So in the year of 2018, there was 194 billion downloads within app stores, both iOS and Google. Of course, you can see this is almost 35% growth over the last two-year period. And if you look at the different countries, i say China probably takes more than 50% of the market. And even if you consider that they had a massive freeze end of 2018 where they were not giving out any licenses to the games, this is still quite huge. And also, if you look at some of the mobile-first countries, you know, Indonesia, Thailand, all of these countries are actually growing like 50, 100% of the time. And we have to also mention India. I mean, India is a story of its own. The revenue per user, of course, is quite small, but the growth is actually unbelievable. You can see over the two-year period, India has grown almost 165% in downloads. The next thing that we usually look at to understand the app economy is the actual time people spend within the mobile apps as well. This is very important. So you can see in the year 2018, almost 1.2 trillion hours have been spent within the mobile apps. If you look to a country to country basis, in UK, this is around three hours every day that you guys will spend in your mobile apps. You know, this could be your emails, your calendar, your search, whatever you do, you will spend almost three hours. In markets like Indonesia, it's actually close to four hours a day where people will spend within app as well. Now, let's learn a few, actually a few things about the gaming industry as well. So we did this chart recently when we were working with one of the big gambling company to understand if the actual, we have a growth within gambling industry as well. So this is from August to December within Android phones which is like a very small market compared to the iOS as well. And you can see it's almost 110% growth in the time spent in the gambling apps. And if you look actually at the overall sports app like Sky News, BBC News, the growth here is actually much smaller. So you can see that sports betting app time spent is actually increasing quite massively as well. A lot of the guys here talked about SEO, but we also what we like to talk about is how different it is if you look, let's say, at mobile browsing and if you look at native app, because Quite a lot of the clients come to us and like, should we do a native app? Is it worth doing a native app? And I'm gonna be able to monetize better. And what we usually show them is this chart here. If you look at the actual share of the time 
your users will probably spend 88% more time in native apps than in mobile web browser. And the share of sessions, so how long are the actual sessions, they will spend almost 93% more time in native apps than they will spend in the mobile browser as well. So the idea here is, of course, you will get a lot more active users on your web browser. But once you get them and you can engage those users, you can convert them into your application. The idea is that the engagement on the mobile apps is much stronger than on the mobile web as well. Cool. All right, let's uh, jump into the ASO now and give you guys a quick overview of what ASO is, and then we'll do like a few case studies as well to understand like which companies are implementing really good strategies. So, what is ASO? It's a continual process of improving your presence on an app store so that you can increase your organic download. Idea here is, and one of actually really good facts from our you know friends at Apple is that 63% of all downloads are actually found organically within Apple using a specific keywords as well. So having a right keyword strategy, having a right categorization, having a really good reviews, good icons actually plays uh, quite a huge role as well. So we have, of course, um, there's a few other things when you look at the influence that we talk about to our clients about. One of them is discoverability, and the second one is conversion. Discoverability is that when people search for you or they search for, let's say, betting as a general term, you can be easily found and you are ranked for the right keyword. And of course, that sometimes you're in the top chart. So if they look at, say, go to the sports industry and they scroll down, you are in the top five or top 10. Once they actually discover you, the next stage is converting those people to download your app. Here are very few important things like icon is very important, the screenshot, what kind of reviews do you have? What kind of offers do you have? How good is your description page? Uh, and then people will make that decision if they want to download your app or not. Also, right now, these days, you know, in uh, Apple, we have almost like 2 million plus apps. And in Android, I think it's like 4 million plus. So choosing the right keywords and choosing the right strategy, I would say, is one of the most important things that you guys will do as well. So let's talk about each store now and kind of discuss what are the key differences. And there's a few of them that are very notable. Um, number one, I would say, is uh, keywords. So you, know, you have your 100-character limit with Apple. You can rank for those keywords. But Google does a bit more. It looks at your description. If a, a keyword has been mentioned between two to five times within your description, you'll be ranking for that one as well. So it's very important to look at this difference. Also, on uh, Google Play Store, you can update on continual basis. So anytime you want, you can change your keywords. Uh, with Apple, you have to actually do a product update as well. So this is a huge difference. So quite a lot of our clients, what would they would do is they would do a quick test on the Google side, see if the keywords work, what kind of reaction do they get, and then they would implement their strategy with a product update on the Apple side as well. Uh, also, backlinks. This is a topic that is discussed quite heavily. You know, Google has advanced this, and if there's like a few backlinks online, so they will do like a massive scan. If they find reviews about you, if they write, find, let's say, users writing about you, they would play quite a huge, you know, would be quite important when you are ranking for these specific keywords as well. Um, so yeah, this is like the Google, how it usually look. Usually we would do like the graphic on the top, you would have an icon, you would have a rating of the app, a short description. And then we'll Google look at stuff like the click-through rate, install rate, retention rate, engagement. So how engaging is your app? What kind of reviews do people leave? Is the click-through rate quite high? Based on this, you will rank for certain keywords much higher as well. Um, and uh, another great thing, as I mentioned already, is the continual update of your keywords, so you can test them pretty much any time as well. With Apple, it's uh, slightly different. So every time you do a keyword change, you have to do a product update, so that's very important. And they are recently concentrating more on the visual side of the thing. So when you search for a specific keyword, there's usually three separate icons or three separate screenshots or a video that come up automatically. So having the right video or having the right image when the people search for your keyword is very, very important as well. And also selecting the right title and selecting the right subtitle as well can play a huge role going forward. Cool, what I'm going to do now is just give you guys a, a three separate case studies. One of them will be a gambling company. One will be a, you know, a FIFA, I would say, the FIFA. And then the third one will be somebody from the outside the industry and how they do ASO as well. So number one is um, Pet Victor and their quick strategy around November time. So previously, what you can see on the top of the screen is the name that Pet Victor had. So this is on the iOS side. You can see that they were called Bet Victor Football Betting App. Around November 27th, they changed it to BetVictor Live Sport Betting app. And you can see automatically they were ranking for the keyword sports betting, which is quite major, around like number 10 or 15. And they skyrocketed automatically. 
they actually improved their traffic for that keyword quite heavily. Almost 12% of their tra traffic came from this keyword. And you know, their downloads jumped by almost like 300%. So this is for free. You don't pay for this. You can do this on your own anytime. You just change a single keyword, make sure it's the right keyword for you, start ranking for it, and start increasing your organic flow as well. But not only keyword, there's a few other things that you can change actually to make sure that you are ranking for the right keywords as well. I mean, we, had, we all know we had a huge World Cup last year. So I mean, FIFA pretty much owns the World Cup, so they have the huge privilege of they can do anything with their branding on this side. But I think it's a good way to demonstrate how do they prepare for it. So they change their name, number one. They adjust their icon, number two. They adjust their screenshots, number four. And they will adjust their description as well. The moment they start adjusting for specific keywords, you can see that almost 85% of the traffic that was driven to the iOS page as well came from like branded keywords like World Cup, FIFA World Cup, and Russia 2018. So these are the keywords you guys could be using as well. I mean, not the World Cup one because there might be a branding issue, of course, but stuff like 2018 on the World Cup, or 2018 in the Russia. FIFA doesn't own keyword Russia, so you can always be ranking for that one as well. And uh, I did a quick search when I came here, before I came, I did a search for the Croatia-England game, game on 11th of the July. And if you look at the top 30, com uh, top 30 companies that were ranking, none of them were actually gambling companies. So this kind of gives you the idea that there's a lot of keywords out there that you could be ranking for, and some of the market share that you guys are losing now as well. And there were actually a lot of gaming companies that were ranking for the World Cup. And yeah, third example is more around like, if you know there's a big event, yeah, there's a big boxing match, um, there's a big horse racing, there's a final, there's something happening, how do you prepare for it? And this one actually comes from the US, from one of our clients called Retail. Uh, they are like an online retailer and Black Friday, as we all know, is a huge event for all of the retailers. So what they have started is around October, they're already uh, putting in Black Friday into their title. So you can see at the end here that they have a Black Friday into the name of the app. Uh, then slowly, slowly, they are moving Black Friday to the, as a first one. So it's very important within Apple also and Google where you are, you know, when the actual keyword is seen. Is it at the beginning of the title? Is it at the end of the title? Uh, and they can see, you know, they are starting to rank for the Black Friday and they have increased their downloads by almost 100%. And the moment the event is finished, they go back to their normal name again. So the idea here is that you start preparing early, find out what are the key events. You know, there's a lot of matches, there's all the horse racing, there's all boxing. Start ranking for them, adjust your titles, maybe start bidding for them. It's totally up to you guys. And then once the event is finished, go back to your normal name as well. You know, majority of the big betting companies would do this as well. Cool. So those were like three case studies. And uh, I just want to give you guys some key takeaways as well when you're doing your ASO, what to concentrate on. Um, Number one is you have to continually test. Usually it's the Asian companies who are very good at this. Every two, three weeks, they would update the icon, they would update their keywords, and then they test these keywords, see how, how people you know, come back onto this, are people searching for this, is my organic download increasing, and then reiterate and reiterate. Number two, which is free as well, mind the reviews you know, of your competitors and yourself as well. Look at those reviews. See what are the keywords that are coming up quite often. Do a quick data dump and do a keyword search. Understand what are users looking for, and based on that, use those your keywords in your ASO strategy as well. Look at your competitors. You know, here at AppAni, we can actually help you understand like what keywords are your competitors ranking for. How much volume do, do, do they get from those keywords and how difficult it is to rank for those keywords? And then look at five different companies and see if you can rank for those keywords that your competitors are ranking for as well. And uh, number four is actually align it with your overall strategy. You know, you have an SEO strategy, you have a strategy on a TV, you have a strategy for the World Cup, you have a big marketing strategy. Align your App Store strategy with a similar thing as well and start ranking for the same words on the App Store side, I think it's as well. Cool. That's it for me, guys. Thanks very much. And I guess we can do a quick Q&A. Any, question? any questions for any three of us? No? All right. Hey, sorry. I have a question for Robert. Alex. Yeah. Alex. Hi. Hi. Um, so I was wondering, you were talking about how keywords are not that, that, that all important and content is also very important. Um, do you think it would be possible to do some sort of A-B testing on different types of content and see how each of, each of those rank according to, well, whichever version is presented? 
Sure, sure, that's possible. But what what I, really the point was before is that we as SEOs need to be in charge and spec out what content should be on the pages. You know, oftentimes, yeah, in certain some companies, there are people producing content, and then the SEO comes in afterwards, puts in some keywords in titles and the text, and then off you go, and they hope that they will rank. So what we need, we need to be in charge, you know, from the idea stage to that you publish the content. But for sure, you can do an A/B testing. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for you also, uh, for the searcher intent, uh, I, I've never seen someone track the data from each day on who ranked. So, do you think the day you post is part of the searcher intent? formula so if let's say you're doing the predictions for a World Cup match you're better off doing it the day before because the searcher intent would be the day of they want the news correct am I following that logic have you seen the data that no, you, you're that? right I mean basically it would be good to for instance do the search intent this year so you're prepared for next year even though it might change yeah so the point is definitely that you should do the you should do the analysis when it's relevant yeah so, but if you were to post it this year and someone's searching it next year, yeah, uh, and Google sees you posted it last year, wouldn't would that defeat the purpose of the search of the searcher intent research? Like, should I be creating content now and waiting for the right time to post it? I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, sometimes there are minor changes happening. For instance, in this case, it would mean that you would additionally also roll out, uh, maybe make sure that you have AMP pages. If you have WordPress, it's easier, and you would also maybe have a YouTube strategy planned. But yes, it's difficult, but at least as close to when the search peaks as possible. Because if you would do this analysis for World Cup page one, ma one month before, it will change a lot. It will change a lot, yeah. Uh, this is for Apani. I use Avani quite frequently, and if I'm evaluating a company where you can track in-app purchases, so you can look at revenue and installs, I'll look at both to see how popular or uh, you know, how much money an app is making, essentially. In categories like sports betting, where you can't see the in-app revenue, what metric alongside installs might you look to see how popular that app is or how engaging it is? So yeah, there's a few. So you can look at active users, number one, which is the easiest one, daily, month, daily, weekly, or monthly active users, see if there's increasing. And you can look at stuff like open rate, how often these app is open, so throughout the you know, monthly or weekly basis as well. Number of sessions and how long the sessions are. And idea here is that more time people spend within your app, the higher is the basket size, and there's a more chance of them being putting together a bigger bet. So, if you look, we do quite, quite a lot of analysis on the sports betting apps for like, especially when you have like live betting or throughout the event. So the apps that have the highest engagement usually are the ones that are performing quite well as well. So I would say looking at the engagement numbers uh, is the most important. So number of sessions, how long are the sessions, active users and open rate. Those would be the five things to look at. Oh, yeah, yeah. So you mentioned uh, a little bit about uh, backlinks and whether or not they should be, I'm oh, sorry, whether or not we should be concentrating on them too much or if we do the page score is a metric that we can possibly use. The question I have is uh, how much impact do you think brand search volume has on your rankings and if it is a relatively large amount, do you think that we should concentrate on creative content marketing processes instead of general backlinking processes? We'll, do, we'll answer this in two parts. So with branded search volume, that obviously comes down to everything you do as a brand and your actual presence. So, I mean, I can see directly behind you a giant pair of inflated Paddy Power um, briefs. When Google, in my experience, recognizes brands, if you type specific queries through, obviously, it's machine learning and what it understands of the data sets out there, it will expect to say, well, if people are searching, so let's use paint for an example. If you're searching for white paint, Google will probably expect you, a user to be able to see Dulux, to be able to see Johnson's, to be able to see Crown. They're brands that users expect to see. So whilst there is an element of trying to rank for those queries, Google still has to satisfy that, in, that initial inherent search intent. And part of that is actually presenting them with the brands they recognize rather than Bob's Paints or something like that. Yeah, definitely. Keyword association 
definitely true. And also, I think that if you look at the feature snippets and how Google is picking which content to surface in the snippets, often correlates with strongly, you know, in terms of content, authoritative websites, right? So if you build up a website and you manage to get a lot of snippets within one topic, it seems like th then you also get topics, uh, snippets in the rest of the subtopics also. So trying to own domains of content, I think, becomes more and more important, for sure. OK, can we have one last round of applause for our fantastic presenters, please? Thanks, ladies and gents.